welcome to Post Media's Ontario election panel on healthcare. I'm Christina Spencer, and I'm the editorial pages editor of the Ottawa Citizen. And joining me today, we have Mohamed Adam, a commentator and political observer who runs a weekly column in Ottawa. We have Jennifer Beeman, who is the health reporter for the London Free Press. And we've got Elizabeth Payne, the health reporter for the Ottawa Citizen. Thanks all for being here today. And healthcare, big topic. The election, as you know, is June the 2nd. And this is going to be one of the biggest themes, I think, that people think about during the election campaign. We can't really start talking about healthcare without starting with COVID, of course. We've all been with COVID-19 with this pandemic for more than two years, and the provincial government has been trying to respond to it. What's interesting in this election, of course, is that the progressive conservatives have a record they have to answer for on COVID. The other parties running against them do not. So my first question for you is, do you think the fact that the PCs have been the party on the hot seat is going to help or hurt their electoral chances on June the 2nd? Jennifer, could I start with you and get your views? Certainly. Um, you know, absolutely, they're going to have to answer for it. It was their you know, government that was making all these decisions. I uh, was speaking to a political science last scientist last week here that had said that, you know, it'll be interesting to see how much the Liberals and the NDP really make hay with that and really attempt to you know, make this a referendum on the pandemic response. There's so many things that people could take issue with. Uh, on the flip side, however, we've sort of seen people trying to kind of move on. Um, now things like cost of living and inflation are really big issues for people. So it'll be interesting to see how much the, the COVID, um, you know, performance of the PCs really influences the vote. Mm -hmm. Mohammed, what do you think? Is it going to hurt or help them that they were the people in charge? Actually, it should hurt them. I mean, because they clearly bungled the... COVID file. But strangely enough, people seem to have moved on. Um, if you look at, at least, if, if we look at the polls, uh, it looks as if people are happy with uh, the Ford government and um, they are on the way to an electoral victory. I mean, we'll have to vote, of course. But so far, they don't seem to have paid a price at all. I think they should. But people know best. Thank you. Elizabeth Payne, I'll just ask you the question slightly differently, if you don't mind, which is, could we have reasonably expected the Liberals or the NDP to ha have handled this pandemic much differently, given what we've seen across the country, what we've seen other governments do and so forth? Well, of course, that's very difficult to say for certain. And one thing I will say is early on, the NDP struggled a bit with the question of vaccine mandates. There was some tension with unions, particularly um, they weren't really comfortable being fully in favor of vaccine mandates. In the end, Andrea Horvath did come out strongly favoring vaccine mandates. But I think that gives you, uh, you know, a sign of some of the tensions that would have been at play under the NDP. Uh, the Liberals, of course, it's difficult to know. Um, you know, I agree with Mohammed that I think there were mistakes made by the Ford government throughout this pandemic. I think they got rid of masks too soon. But I think they have benefited hugely by the fact that people are so sick of COVID. The weather is nice. Uh, they have done an excellent job of convincing people that it's over. And, you know, people won't have to really think about it again, perhaps till next fall. So I think they're, they've benefited from that. So I'm going to come back to Jennifer and what you just said a few minutes ago about maybe uh, the opposition parties trying to make this a bit of a referendum on COVID. Looking at the platforms so far from the parties, I'm not seeing as much as I might have thought I would see on prevention and dealing with future pandemics of this sort. Uh, I wonder if you could just speak for a minute to uh, what you've seen um, in the party platforms, particularly from the opposition, on preparing us for future pandemics. Well, we know the Liberals are coming in hot with the kind of tagline that the conditions of, of work are the conditions of care. They're really focusing on frontline workers and really improving that sort of aspect of the system. Uh, PCs have come out with, of course, infrastructure, which is really flashy and exciting and big ticket items. Um, just here in London, I mean, we've got a, a university hospital here and built in the 60s, uh, which really had a, a very deadly outbreak of COVID back in the fall of 2020. And, you know, in an aging building like that, you know, inf infection prevention and control is not as easy. So 
you know, maybe that's sort of one way that the PCs are, are trying to kind of attack future pandemics or, or change the trajectory of it. But, you know, like Elizabeth was saying, like, people are kind of moving on. People are sort of living their lives again, at least for the next, you know, spring and summer. So maybe uh, COVID will not become a ballot box question quite the way we all thought it would a month ago. What do you think, Mohammed? Yes, absolutely. I, I don't think I don't think it will. And if you look at the platforms, there's not really much about what to do, uh, how to prepare for a future pandemic. We don't have anything at all, not much in the platforms. So it looks as if the parties have, at least the PCs have decided this is not going to be a big issue and um, they will, people will just have to fight on other issues. Now, the NDP has said that if it were elected, it would call a public inquiry into the COVID response. Good idea, Liz Payne, bad idea? Um, that's a tough one. Public inquiries are difficult and challenging. They cost a lot of money. Uh, they take a lot of time. By the time um, you know they come up with something, it maybe is too late. So I don't know about that. One thing I will say that the NDP do have in their platform is a bit of a focus on public health. And I think I, I don't think it will be an election issue whatsoever because public health never is, sadly. And I think what we've experienced over the last two years tells the tale of that. Um, but they have uh, promised to undo the PC plans to merge all public health units something that has really flown under the radar and kind of got put on hold during the pandemic. Um, but municipalities are crying out about that. Um, I think that's a reason to worry. The public health is already hugely understaffed, understressed. Um, they've been battling this and not doing other things. Um, so I think that can be seen as one of their answers to preventing, um, to preventing our putting us in a better position in the future, at least recognizing the importance of public health, which was a huge issue of contention among, you know, doctors, health experts, epidemiologists, and the, the Ford government throughout this, that it wasn't science-based, they weren't listening. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. Do I think people care about it? Not really, sadly, I think they should. <laughs> Perhaps not really until they need to, until we're hearing our medical officers of health, uh, who I think really had the trust of a lot of the population. Jennifer, I'm not sure if it was like that in London, but in Ottawa, you know, people really, really admired their uh, public health officer, the, the local one, and uh, were willing, certainly in the first part of the, the uh, COVID outbreaks, to, uh, to heed what she said and, and follow what she said. Was it like that in London? It was really great here. We kind of all rallied around. Our, Dr. Mackey was the, the first one, and then he kind of took a leave later on, and it was Dr. Summers. No Londoners have been really generally pretty good about following our public health people. We're not as cool as Ottawa Health with your exciting little social media things, but um, certainly there's been a lot of respect for that institution. I think people, it's really opened people's eyes to the role public health plays and the stuff they can really accomplish. So this is not an either or thing, but I'm going to make the question a little bit this way, if you don't mind. Jennifer, you talked about hospitals, um, specifically what's happening in London. And Liz, you've talked about public health, the less sexy thing. The Ford government is really, really uh, coming down hard on infrastructure spending, right? Um, hospital spending, it's going to be, I think, something like 40 billion over a decade, 27 or 28 billion of that for infrastructure. They've uh, listed in their budget uh, all sorts of hospital things they will do. Haven't listed too much on the public health file, as you say. Are we forever doomed to have hospitals be our response when we have public health emergencies or anything else? You know, the big institutions. Mohammed, I'll ask you first, just because you didn't get in on that last little bit, and then I'll do a round here. Well, you see, my, the issue with healthcare in general for me is we're spending what last year we spent what 184 billion something like that and still we're not solving the problems so my thing is is it just about money or is it about how we spend the money um i'm not sure that we've got the issue right i mean still we're supposed to be per capita the lowest in the country how can that be when we are spending so much money? So it's, it's very difficult for me to understand 
the healthcare issue. Um, we probably should take a look at it. Is it the money or is it how we spend it? We have to get a grip on it. So uh, uh, you're even more ambitious than the NDP, right? It wants a public inquiry into COVID. I think you want one into the whole healthcare system here. <laughs> okay, Liz, any comments on that before I move to another topic that is very closely related? Mm. Um, well, there's lots and lots of spending, um, but I would agree with Mohammed. I, I think um, we need a we need you need new hospitals when they're old. You also need to look at the way you're delivering care, and that includes um, home care, long-term care, hospitals, and yes, we are going big, big hospitals these days. So we'll see where that takes us. Okay, so um, from hospitals then to long-term care, which is the other big spending item that involves institutions in this province. COVID, of course, took out so many people who were in long-term care. Have we, first of all, solved the immediate issue of protecting them from things like pandemics? I'll get into the fate of long-term care itself, perhaps in a minute. But just in terms of pandemic response and protecting the people who are in uh, the frail elderly and, and frail other people who are in long-term care. Jennifer, where do we stand with that right now? You know, it's it's always been the one spot where there was it was just so exposed, right, and so vulnerable from the get go. Um, we've tried to the province has really tried to protect them as best they can with rapid testing and really cohorting staffs. So they're not hopping from place to place to place. Um, vaccination and long term care they prioritized early, fourth dose boosters roll out all of it. So, um, you know, there's. It, it appears as though right now things have kind of stabilized in long-term care, which has been really good to see. Um, but man, there's some giant systemic issues, including, but not limited to the fact that people seem to want to age at home and, and there's really not a, a plan in a, in a major way to really bolster home care, which I think is something that, you know, parties really need to pay attention to, particularly the PCs. Yes. Okay. Elizabeth Payne. Uh, long-term care. Well, um, there are long waiting lists. There aren't enough beds. Um, the, the PCs have, have gone heavy into those announcements. Um, they have done them all with, uh, almost all, not all of them, with private companies, including some of those that have the absolute worst records, including at least one where the armed forces have to go in and clean feces off the wall. And so those companies, I mean, so that does put paid to the claim that they're, you know, it's okay. We need, we need the money. So we need private investment in this, which arguably is correct. Um, but we're fine because we're being so tough on long-term care enforcement now. And in fact, there's no evidence of that. So, um, so that's, you know, the bottom line, but beyond enforcement, beyond having people go in and, and catch, you know, abuse and things that are happening, you know, is it a private and public question? Maybe not so much, but it is a question of smaller and better and focusing on the kind of care that is done in long-term care. And I do fear this rapid, rapid growth that is going to be happening now um, will mean that doesn't happen. I'm interested um, to hear you say that because in looking again at what the parties have talked about so far, I'm not seeing anyone talk particularly about innovation and care for the elderly. Jennifer mentioned uh, home care, but even in long-term care institutions, we've seen you know some early experimentations with things like the, the butterfly model and other ways of making this institutionalized care a lot less institutional. Now, am I correct? I'll just stick with you for a second, uh, Liz Payne. Am I correct that we're not really seeing much innovative um, in terms of what the parties are putting forward on this? Um, I think that's correct. I'm not absolutely positive. And if not, I, you know, what needs to happen is a way to, to encourage homes, uh, to support homes in a better way to do that kind of thing, as opposed to just, you know, as you say, some are. Um, I have seen talk about the butterfly model and so forth, but I haven't seen any ideas for making more homes like that. It may be that we're asking political parties for too much during a short campaign. <laughs> Mohammed, what about long-term care? Sorry. Mohammed, what about uh, long-term care versus home care versus uh, just ways parties are thinking about this? Have you got some thoughts? I think, I think why the situation in the long-term care homes are stabilized right now, long-term, long-term, there is still a problem. I think 
the issue is what Jennifer just said, home care. Most seniors want to spend their lives at home. They don't want to be in institutional care. They don't want to be warehoused in all these uh, uh, homes. And I think we should, the governments, should pay more attention to home care. I think that's where the emphasis should be. I would not build any new long-term care homes, especially for profit ones. The emphasis, I think, should shift to home care. It's good that the, the PCs are promising, I think, $1 billion, um, for home care. That's a good start. But we need more. We need to do more in home care. That's where the attention should be, not just you know, in these private home, uh, long-term care homes. Okay, I'm going to ask you a little bit just quickly about um, staffing in healthcare. So we're talking doctors, nurses, PSWs. Um, Mohammed, you made the comment a little earlier about we're spending so much money in healthcare in Ontario. Why do we have shortages everywhere? And staffing is a big one right now. Stephen Del Duca, the Liberal leader, has uh, just talked about uh, promising to make access to a doctor possible for everybody in Ontario within 24 hours if they need one, which to me seems like a very, very ambitious goal. Um, so I'll just ask for your input on that as a, as a pledge or a promise, and maybe you can use it to talk a little bit about uh, the healthcare staffing crisis. So Jennifer, and then I'll go to Elizabeth, and then to you, Mohammed. That certainly is ambitious. Uh, there's a lot of Ontarians without a primary care provider right now. There's shortages of, of kind of people that are entering family medicine. Um, they came out a couple, you know, maybe a month or so ago with this plan to really graduate more graduates from medical school, which is, is great and fine and everything, but you kind of need a bigger plan and a longer term strategy to really attract and retain these people in this really, really in demand pressure cooker of a job. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to throw out big numbers and campaign promises, but it sounds like there needs to be a stable, reasoned, well thought out, frankly, unsexy plan for keeping, you know, doctors in their job, seeing patients and, and really recruiting and retaining them. So I, I don't really think that we've seen that from any party specifically. Um, Liz Payne, I would anticipate that you might talk a little bit about nurses and TSWs in this regard. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for the doctor thing, I think it doc should be doctors and nurse practitioners if they really want to, because nurse practitioners can serve that role. And uh, it's that's a Pandora's box, and it's very difficult, and it involves those crazy doctors' contracts that get negotiated and are very difficult to, to <laughs> untangle. So, um, I mean, I think you would need a whole clinic-type system without independent doctors, but I don't know. I, I mean... On the other hand, yes, nurse practitioners there should be more, um, even more than there are now, who can really, especially in the north and remote areas, can carry a heavy load that would be carried by family physicians otherwise. Uh, the, the, the current government has worked a lot with giving more power to pharmacies, which also goes a certain distance towards taking some pressure off um, family doctors if you can get diagnosed with something simply and, and prescribed at a pharmacist. That's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, the real problem are numbers. And um, and I don't think you can talk about this without Bill 124. I mean, I think that's a real problem. I mean, it's obviously a massive problem for nurses. Um, yes, the entire Ontario government public sector has had its wages frozen and compensation frozen at 1%. So that includes everything. Uh, but it, when it came to nurses, um, that was a real blow at a time when they're so short staffed, even at the best of times, they've been working, you know, running this marathon that never ends. They're seriously burnt out and in rough shape. Um, and the Ford government is, is not, you know, it has offered a $5,000 retention bonus to nurses, um, but it is not going to repeal Bill 124. Both other parties have said they would. Um, they've also talked, they all talk about increasing pay for PSWs, which is important. Um, you, you have to do that. You know, there's various levels they've talked about. Um, getting people into the business is going to be tough. Canada is competing with the rest of the world. There's international shortages. Um, people, you know, are just leaving the business because they can't take it anymore. Um, so that's going to be a very difficult thing uh, for anyone. And I think every idea that you can do to train, retain, 
find new people, get people excited about those jobs, find other ways to do some of the services are all going to be important and necessary over the next little while. Okay. Mohammed, last word to you, I think. Well, think about it. You see, we are spending all this money. And right now, more than a million people in Ontario don't have a family doctor, right? Nurses are complaining. They are not being respected. They are not being appreciated. Doctors are complaining. So <laughs> the whole healthcare system is in a mess. And, and I don't see anything the parties are offering other than, you know, they make promises and they don't really mean much. The liberal plan about, you know, getting people, uh, doctors within 24 hours, on paper is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's good to get people to a doctor. Um, but, you know, will it fly? Has it been well thought out? I have no idea. Fair enough. And on, on that very optimistic note, Mohammed, um, healthcare, I think, will not go away, even if we have many, many other issues uh, that will be in front of us before June 2nd. So I just want to thank you all for your insights today on this issue, and I'm sure we'll be talking again. Thank you. Thank you.